I am not a burn surgeon. I'm put that out up front, but I've taken a special interest in burns, and I've been have the fortune lately of um, taking on a lot of the burn care. Um, so I thought it would be nice to give you a simple uh, refresher on burn management. This is pretty basic stuff, and I thought I'd just give you a nice refresher on things. So uh, I have no disclosures. Unfortunately, nobody wants to pay me for any of my vast knowledge. So these are object the objectives. Just quickly go over the initial assessment. Acute resuscitation, try to make it a little bit uh, simpler. Um, the military uses a different formula that I'll tell you about that I think is a little bit easier to remember for uh, fluid resuscitation. Uh, give you some uh, ideas for the basic uh, reasons to, to call the burn center for transfer. And uh, to sum that up, it's if you don't feel comfortable taking care of the patient, give us a call. We'll, we'll help you out. And then uh, some special considerations and a little bit about wound care if you're going to take on the care of some of the smaller burns. Uh, just uh, quickly, this, there's a lot of resources out there. The American Burn Association has got a lot of useful information. And then, of course, my favorite uh, is the U.S. Army Institute for Surgical Research and the Joint Theater Systems uh, Clinical Practice Guidelines. And uh, they've got a really nice, concise uh, burn CPG that is, you know, 14 or 15 pages long, but it's a really quick, easy read. So the initial assessment. So of course, if any uh, trauma patient comes in or any burn patient comes in, you always want to do your ATLS primary and secondary first surveys first and try to avoid being distracted by the burns. And anytime you're dealing with polytrauma and you're concerned that they're having bleeding, like Dr. Kirby was talking about, we need to, to focus on damage control resuscitation at that point and take care of their hemorrhagic shock before worrying about their burn resuscitation. And uh, if you have any questions about uh, intubating the patient, I tried to make it easy. You know, if they're obviously if they're comatose, comatose GCS of three, yes, absolutely, go ahead and place a tube. Uh, in, if you have symptomatic inhalation injury and you're concerned for any sort of problems in transport, go ahead and, and uh, intubate the patient. Deep facial burns, that's a good indication to go ahead and intubate. Um, burns over 40% uh, total body surface area, they're going to require a lot of uh, resuscitation and that fluid is going to leak out into the uh, thorax and they're going to get pl uh, pleural effusion. So, uh, so good idea to consider early intubation in those patients as well. Just a word of advice, don't use LMAs, they don't work. And if you're gonna place a tube, please try to put at least an 8 uh, ET tube at a minimum to facilitate uh, uh, fiber optic bronco bronchoscopy to suction out the airways. Thank you. <laughs> so this is the chart that everybody dreads. You know, you can't ever remember uh, what is the arm? Is it four and a half? Is it nine? I can't remember. Unfortunately, I can't give you any simple ways of remembering this other than keeping one of these charts somewhere close by handy that you can pull it out and take a look at it. Um, but then it really breaks, breaks it down and makes it easy when you can look at the chart. If you don't have the chart in front of you, it, the, uh, the quick and dirty method of estimating it is if you use the patient's palm, that's usually equal to about 1% of the burn surface. And if you just estimate that over the total surface area, that'll give you the, num the total number. Uh, so I'm not gonna belittle uh, this uh, first degree, second degree, third degree, we all know this, but uh, it, you can't determine the depth of um, injury if you don't actually look at it and feel it and if you can't see it because it's covered by dirt soot or whatever you're, gonna, you're not gonna be able to get an accurate depiction so you gotta actually clean the wounds and get a good look at it um, but you know the the thing that tricks most people is the the deep partial thickness looks like a third it can look like a third degree but it will be sensate typically will have still have sensation and the hair follicles will still be present most of the time so that's a good way to differentiate between deep partial thickness and third degree. So uh, with the acute resuscitation, of course, you're not going to worry about this typically in any adult patients unless they have at least 20% or greater total body surface area. In that's counting second and third degree only. And they're typically going to require a, a fair amount of fluid trans, uh, trans infusions in the first 24 to 48 hours. Uh, lactated ringers or plasmolite is the preferred solution. 
uh, because you'll get into electrolyte um, imbalances with, with massive infusion of normal saline. So how do you remember the form, you know, Parkland's formula, that's that complicated, it's not really that complicated, but I can't ever remember it. So is it, you know, four times the total body surface area and whatever. So the military uses the rule of tens. So it's just simply 10 milliliters per hour times the total body surface area that's burned. Um, and that gives you your hourly fluid rate. And that's for your, uh, we have the convenience in the military of having patients that fall on a narrow, uh, weight range. Uh, typically, we don't have a lot of obese patients, but for 40 to 80 kilogram patients, uh, that makes that formula really simple. Anybody over 80 kilograms, you just add 100 mLs for, per hour for every 10 uh, kilograms over 80. It's really important to try to avoid uh, fluid boluses in the uh, early stages of the resuscitation unless they're having overt hypotension. And then there, you hear a lot about uh, albumin uh, rescue. <laughs> Uh, and there's a lot of talk about that. I'm not going to go into the details of albumin rescue because if you uh, need to, that's probably a patient that needs to be transferred to a burn center and you need to get them there quickly. So, of course, place a Foley. You can't tell how well you're uh, resuscitating someone if you can't measure their urine output. So how do you know you're doing it right? Your urine output should be about 30 to 50 mLs an hour and you increase that rate by 20 to 25 percent per hour to maintain a proper urine output. Uh, and that's using that formula, the rule of tens formula. Uh, danger zone area to avoid is if the patient has received um, 200 to 250 mLs per kg of total fluids over the 24 hour period puts them at an increased risk for abdominal compartment syndrome and ARDS. Uh, so in, at the 12 hour mark is when we typically will start to try to predict how much fluid they're going to receive over the next 12 hours. And if they're in that danger zone, then we need to start using other, other things like albumin to try to reduce the total amount of fluid that's being infused. So trans, the transfer criteria, again, you know, just uh, I like this KISS principle. I, I live by the KISS principle, so keep it simple, stupid. So, uh, you know, anything with second degree burns over 10% of the uh, total body surface, you know, go ahead and send them third degree burns. This is the one that we get the most is uh, face, hands, feet, uh, perineum, and genitalia. Uh, electrical burns, you know, can be a little bit more complex, so go ahead and send those, as well as chemical burns. Anybody with an inhalation injury, uh, patients that are uh, complex, um, multi-medical problem type patients, go ahead and send those as well. And if you have any questions or concerns, you know, feel free to just give us a call and we'll, like I say, we'll, uh, we're happy to help. And some special considerations. So uh, you know, we always hear that you know antibiotics don't aren't, aren't needed typically, and that's that stands true. So top, not typically in, indicated in the absence of infection, but you do want to give tetanus for every trauma patient. If you do uh, clinically diagnose somebody with a wound infection, you need to have uh, broad spectrum coverage of so vancomycin for the gram negatives and a carbapenem or a fourth gen, fourth generation cephalosporin for the gram negative coverage. It is okay to place uh, an IV through a burn. Um, it, you don't want to keep it there for an extended period of time if you don't have to, but you can place IVs through burns. You can place IOs through burns. Uh, we use a lot of IOs in the military. I'm a big fan of those. Um, secure them with uh, suture or staples because tape or tegaderm, things like that, they're not going to stick to the burns. And then use, a, of course, you, know, you can use umbilical tape to secure your ET tubes, OG tubes, NGs, and dop offs. Uh, questions, we get, a, we get a lot of questions about if a patient needs an escharotomy before transport, and typically they're, even with uh, full thickness circumferential burns, if they're coming to us within a reasonable amount of time, there's not really an indication to do the escharotomy. We can usually take care of that on our end. Um, but they may be needed, uh, especially in the circumferential full thickness burns. If it is, if they are needed, it usually will present itself in the first six hours or later on in the first 24 hours. Elevating the extremities can help reduce the uh, the risk of that, and I recommend using electrocautery. Um, the the skin doesn't burn, uh, doesn't bleed a whole lot usually, but uh, the subcutaneous tissues can usually bleed a lot. So uh, you may it's it's helpful to have electrocautery. You can just get that brought down from the operating room. And then you know where where I was trained, I was always taught you know oh there you know those burn those third degree burns are insensate. You don't need to use pain medicine or any kind of benzos. And then 
through, you know, just experience through the years, uh, I've noticed that a lot of the patients will still, especially because of subcutaneous tissues and everything underneath the skin is still sensate unless they have, you know, fourth degree burns. But uh, so go ahead and give them some pain medicine. It's not going to hurt anything. It doesn't really take a little bit more time. So, so a little bit for wound care. Um, if you're going to transfer the patients to the burn center immediately, you just, mainly the thing you need to focus on is keeping the patient warm and covering the burns with some sort of uh, dry dressing. It doesn't even need to be sterile. Some people are real anal about that, but it doesn't need to be sterile. And if it's, if it's appropriate, of course, start the fluid resuscitation. Uh, if you're going to defer the, trend, uh, the referral to the burn center and send them to our clinic, uh, just clean the burns well with an antiseptic cleanser. There's some, there's some on the market that are specifically made for use in burns. Uh, Puricin is one of those. Um, and then, you, I, like I say, I like to keep it simple for the dressings. So you're either going to do daily or every other day dressings with an antibiotic ointment. Or there's some uh, burn-specific dressings out now that are sil silver-based. Uh, Mepilex and Silverline are the two that I see uh, most commonly used, and those don't require changing at all for the first five to seven days. So you can slap that on the on the burn, dress it with a dry dressing, and send them to the burn clinic in three or four days, and they'll be fine. Uh, 